right? Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Kiro Gerstein, um, and you have tuned into uh, an online seminar with the great composer, conductor, pianist, musician, Thomas Addis. This is part of um, Kiro Gerstein Invites, a series of online seminars at the Hans Eisler Musikhochschule in Berlin, but we are in a virtual space which allows us to be welcoming guests from uh, uh, all over the world. And particularly, it's a thrill to, to have Thomas with us, who is a um, uh, singularly great musician, and I am also honored to say a dear friend and uh, a music, uh, music collaborator and, and a personal friend. So Thomas, wonderful to, to have you with us, that you have agreed to, um, to come out of your compositional lair uh, during I mean, lockdown and yes. to speak to us about roots, seeds and life cultures, as we discussed um, yesterday on the, on the phone. So I'm sure everybody is um, uh, interested what, uh, what this might mean, if this is finally a talk on agriculture. <laughs> Hello, Carol. Yes, well, in manner of speaking, my, that's an ice cream van outside my house. That's not anything to do with me. But... Good. Yeah. So, what what did you have in mind when you uh, when you said, "Well, oh. it's really all about roots and how music material is unbound oh. to particular pieces?" As I think you've led off uh, our initial discussion about this. Well, I mean. You know, you, you and I have worked on a brand new piece and also on transcriptions and of work for, uh, from my opera and also a piece in seven days, which is takes as its kernel six bars or uh, seven bars from another piece from my opera. And I thought that actually, if we're going to talk about what I do in this work of composing, um, it might be quite helpful to to try and describe people who, who may wonder um, what it involves to have a blank piece of paper in front of you. Do you just write anything that comes into your head? Yes, I think, I think it's both, uh, both composers present, performers present and right. listeners present are um, yeah. curious about anything related. I mean, yes, and I, it was, I suppose it was in some ways it, uh, the idea of this, this theme at first I said live cultures, which is how I think of some existing music that it seems to invite further experimentation, further unfolding. But then it struck me that the, 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 the bigger image would be of a root in the gardening, where there's a root of a plant, which in large parts of the year, some plants are only exist almost as roots. And that I, I as a human and as a composer, have roots. And they may be in my own music, they may be in the, the rich uh, other existing um, uh, you know, explorations and researches that already have been made by those who have gone before us, <laughs> and that um, and how you, how you work that you know, what put the point on the sliding scale between entirely brand new and uh, simply playing something which is already written exactly as written. There's a sliding scale in between, and I suppose I, I've um, as life's gone on from when I started writing. I've moved further and further in both directions on, on that scale. But I think looking back, I can see I've always been on that scale in some way. Well, and your music, I think, also has always made uh, on me, and I'm sure on others, uh, uh, in the best sense, a particularly rooted impression because um, you do uh, build on top of what has, uh, what has come before, which, uh, which is natural and creative, but not denying what has come before. Well, I suppose build is another very useful word, actually, because, you know, when you think about music, I think it's not just about sound, you know, it's, it's in some ways, it's, it's, you're using sound, but you're making a structure, certainly, in the tradition that I'm working in, that's when it becomes interesting to me when you know, music is a realm that's beyond uh, and above and and behind you know the visual world 
but it's there. It's just invisible, but the structures are, are, are as real. And it's not just something that's, um, I, when it's just useful in a sense, uh, you know, to create a particular mood or feeling that, you know, you, that you want to feel happy or all that, or you put this on so it's a kind of pabulum or uh, to, to just do something functional. That's not so interesting to me. So I, I, just, I think what's exciting is when it has the structure that um, it maps a kind of hit a, a, an invisible a, a shape, an invisible one. So you are building. And why would I not take advantage of you know existing uh, <laughs> research in this field? <laughs> well, and it's and it's a long running tradition from from the composers of seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century, and certainly. People like Stravinsky, whose birthday it is today, seems to have. Oh, where is it? Is it? Oh, I see. Oh, well, that's nice. Well, we could talk about him. A, it's a good day to have a talk with you. And last well, time, yeah. we uh, talk yeah. about Mr. Kurtag's opera, where we also yeah. saw that the seeds were from uh, from the uh, earliest pieces of his appearing in his 90s while he's composing the opera. I, 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 well, it's very understandable that, you know, but I, I think. Um, um, that's the, the classic case of Stravinsky, that he can manage to take something sometimes, which is literally somebody else's music almost completely, but there's something that he will do to the weight of it, or maybe add a note or take a note away, or something about it that suddenly it's uh, it's him. That's a that's an extreme case, but the, you know, the, the, um, um, yeah. And um, so in, in the, I, I haven't actually, um, it's only quite recently that I've started to uh, allow things to appear quite literally from from existing music. I got a piece I wrote uh, last year, I think it was. I lost track of time now. Um, Inferno, which is it, it's about f 45, 50 minutes of ballet with Liszt uh, as a model almost throughout, um, but it moves from things which are actually a hundred percent Liszt. They're just orchestrated literally by me in quite an elaborate way. There's a couple, a couple of bits like that through to the other end of the scale is 100% me and nothing to do with list at all, which there are some numbers. And then, but what was fun for me was the bits in the middle where I started to not really be able to tell where the dividing line uh, was. And, and uh, you know, um, and uh, I had actually, there's, I don't know if you remember the lugubrious gondola, the yes, list. And I think, I think I have the, if, if technology cooperates with with me, uh, I think I have the score of the uh, in, Inferno here. If you right. want to uh, to show any particular example, oh, right. I think that well, it's, would be possible. Actually, in fact, well, it suddenly struck me that, that it's called the Ferryman. It's the the third movement. But the, I've changed the list. The list is um, in six eight. I think. Uh, Apologies, my piano hasn't been tuned for years. I just only notice when anybody else hears it. <laughs> and then, and then it, sometimes it's my own. Uh, something makes me uh, because I lack the gift, the gift of patience. I don't have as much patience as maybe uh, I should. So oh, I took. Yeah. Was it on in the in your score? in the big score? It says twenty two here, but I I, I can't. I, um, don't hold me to that. It, it's, it went through many versions. Yeah. yeah. And so I, where he has this two bars of six, eight, so that's 12, eight, eight. And I, I just took one away in the first verse. So it says, uh, uh, I mean, it's a very simple change. In the second verse, um, I took another one away because I'm even more, uh, and it's partly in patience, but it's also because what, what I, the reason I think I'm attracted to this, uh, this, material and why it is a live culture for me is that this um, this uh, uh, ambiguity so I, I by changing the rhythm one can one can put more emphasis on, on the fleeting the fleeting tonalities that are not the main tonality the main tonality is actually this which only appears once or twice towards the end but just an example when i was writing that I, I i might have actually sat down and thought i'm going to orchestrate la lugubre gondola literally and then it came out of you know it went into me and came out of my pen with these sort of 
uh, losses, these things that were erasures or taken away, because it, and then that that meant I think that it was alive, because in inside the root there is a sort of force always that's that's sliding along, and uh, that's the thing that I want to harness, you know. <laughs> yes. Mm. There, T. Um. So that's that's list but then i was thinking also that that, that the, the first time the, these are things that can go quite a long way back and you talked about kurtak who's now 94 going you know drawing on existing pieces of his own which back in the 1950s you said so how long is that it's over 60 years ago um that there's material i i realized that actually goes back to, to my childhood when I what I had was I mean records in my parents collection which was quite a strange mixture of things and and and, um, and uh, you know in my 20s 30s uh, I would think about some of this material thinking should, should I actually use that and I had a sense that I, sh I it was something to to save up and not squander too early because there, there are things that would have that simply obsess you and uh, that I think those have to come out in some way or other inevitably eventually because they they uh, they uh, sort of take take over um, and then in my third in my opera um, the exterminating angel this thing a particular song it was a record of um, uh, Ladino uh, Sephardic folk songs very beautiful record uh, that absolutely obsessed me I listened to it over and over again I didn't know it wasn't like anything else I now realize it, it yeah, there was a reason. I mean, just with this music had something in it, and this particular song, um, I think it was. It's endless verses, and it's very sad. You know, and it goes on about this this woman who's uh, looking for her husband. Will he come back from the war? Um, and it's rather eerie. And I think he really appears as a ghost. And that it just it seems so perfect for the atmosphere of the, the exterminating angel. You know, sort of right country, Spain, and the right uh, sense of exile and everything. But the, the way it works, it struck me the other day in the opera. So what happens is that it's a piece that is now a piano piece that I know. Yeah, I know. think I can show that as well. The variations of Blanca. And the, it, it's variations that, that are played in the, in the opera as a, as a salon piece. But actually the whole of the next scene continues being variations underneath in the orchestra while the, the action goes on, on this thing. So they sort of unspool endlessly. And I realized that one of the reasons is that the way the song is constructed, the harmony of the tune, is that uh, it, it never resolves. It is always, you know, the ending is always the same as the beginning, and it goes round, round the circle. And and in in uh, so, uh, I mean, it, the actual tune would be. I, I played. And um, it struck me the other day that actually the way this starts, I mean, it really is like a plunge into my, you know, probably you know, distant, try, you know, three, four, five years old childhood, listening to this that, that tune. Um, and in the opera, it actually begins with the sound of a broken glass, you know, a window is smashed and the piece starts. And I think that's quite truthful because it has, I have sort of really plunged a fist through a window there in my own in my own psyche of some kind into uh, um, a repository which is a little bit outside time you know it's outside time in my own world and that's what's happening in the opera that they by entering this enchanted house as it were, whatever cursed house they have fallen into eternity in some way so that's why that music kind of goes underneath and uh, there are comments that the, the characters sing actually uh, what how, no, how nostalgic this music is, <laughs> which, which I would like that because it's a further mise en abeam, you know, it's an, an endless sort of endless falling down a well. It's all, it is actually like a well, isn't it? There's another metaphor. <laughs> so. Yes, it's, uh, it's beautiful. And uh, the way you um, 
also managed to control your refracted prismatic rubato even already in the presentation of the theme is uh, very very much handwritten by you oh refracted is a terrific uh, image actually for my music you know that that comes in a lot of a lot of times in fact that in fact it's a technique of harmonic refraction I use later on happens to that tune that that, that you, you shift the modulations uh, just shift systematically and um, I, I like that well that's because uh, I, can I, go, I can go on to the uh, to the to the next page one second uh, I'm not sure I'll be able to play that but <laughs> well you know you can post it so we won't we won't hold you um, <laughs> But it does. It does. I think it won't. It won't display because uh, because encoder is a complicated thing when you do screen sharing. But you can. But, but display it for but us. You, well, you can. You can see that uh, there's a very. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> So each each time each bar it modulates again further away in the same. It's almost like I've taken a um, a characteristic structure that's in the in the tune, like a you know like a knuckle or something, and reproduced it, but uh, at, at a at a logical place rather than the place that it happens in the tune. I've reproduced it at the next joint, so that instead of going on the same direction, it goes like that. And so it goes some somewhere else. Well, these, uh, <laughs> these sort of uh, almost like cellular automata assembling themselves on on sort of ever escalating levels is something that a hundred percent. And it, it's like it's uh, I, that's fascinates me. The kind of crafts the craft of, of of building these structures is the most exciting thing to me. I'm not I'm not a very uh, I said about um, about utilitarian. Stru useful structures are not so interesting. I, li I like, uh, I'm too 18th century, I'm from the wrong century, let's say I'm 18th century. So I think if you're going to build a palace, you don't think I just need a big room that a lot hundreds of people are going to be able to use. You think, uh, you think about every detail of the molding of the kind of, you know, maybe the, the Rococo uh, molding, which is reproducing um, natural forms that are outside. Which are about, you know they're not random, but they grow in a natural way, and you grow you grow enough of those, and you end up with uh, with a palace. <laughs> yes, I, I remember being struck once when you said uh, a few years back, I think that you really uh, you feel yourself a, a, a Baroque composer living in the twentieth twenty first century. Well, somebody said that, and I'd never have dared say it. But I thought I thought oh yeah, I have a feeling that I see what they mean, you know. That was especially um, whatever that whatever that actually means. But I, I resisted it. I think I resisted this for a long time because in 1993, let's say, when I was starting, um, it would have been um, unthinkable really, to, to be a Baroque composer in that in that any sense at all. You had to sort of be something else uh, to, to 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 survive. <laughs> but I think actually it was it was there. And, uh, a bit, uh, and I didn't even know myself. So I sometimes, when I if I ever come across music that I wrote around that time, uh, it, I have a funny sense that it's like a radio that's that's slightly not quite tuned in right all the time. It sort of comes in and out, or just like we were, were using faxes in those days, and things would sometimes come out, you know, with you know, blurry bits. And um, and I think now I would think if it can be said clearly, one one should try to. Because things can't always be said clearly, but it's a bit to do with, um, uh, again, one of the reasons that sometimes I'm I'm drawn to existing music or an, exist, or an existing picture of some something because the, the um, that uh, those things are resolved already in some way, but uh, they're still. Um, not set they're not kind of set do you know what i mean so if you look if you imagine um volcanic earth some, or a volcanic area some of it is set and hardened and some of it might in theory be soft and still malleable so but it's still part of the landscape so i, I kind of look for those places um and yeah and i think i i can't resist i told you that i would ask you uh and i remember that a uh, long time ago when we were in, in, in Boston, I think that's 2012, when I asked you about these uh, favorite uh, chords uh, in the end of In Seven Days that, that seems so, um, so logical yet uh, 
resist some kind of traditional analysis. I'm talking about the... And then you told yeah. me that, um, that in fact, these are the chords that didn't fit into the Tempest and, um, and therefore you had to write another 30 minute piece about, you know, several billion, several hundred billion year <laughs> universe. So uh, could you, could you, could you elaborate? I'll, I'll put the, I'll put the chords up on the, uh, on the screen. This is from the, uh, well, a lot of in seven days is based on this, but then particularly the, um, you, one hears them at the very end of the piece, for example, here, um, there they are in the, in the top, in the top, uh, second line. Uh, yes. And well, and, and it, it was, they, they do appear in the, the opera, the Tempest, they come at the end of an aerial song, uh, five fathoms deep. And, but, uh, because of the drama at that moment, they had to be orchestrated in a very full dramatic way. And what I, I always just wanted, I knew they should be heard only on four solo violins, which is what happens at the end of In Seven Days. But in, in order to make that moment real, you know, in, a, in, a, in music, uh, I had to write this whole structure to them. So it would be like, for example, a particular shaped window or a particular colored stained glass window in a building in a cathedral you can't just have that window on its own it wouldn't make any sense you had to build the whole cathedral to sort of put it in and it shows up at, at the end and um i don't know what it was uh, and the whole of that song is just one chord after another um but then at the end this and, and they're done with the process of refraction like you say so that it would be like five fathoms deep you would see a fish here and then the chord would suddenly appear here or there so that the way that it moved is like fish in shallow uh, seawater and then these chords at the end were sort of an extreme point of refraction where you got the the the, the sense of all all five fathoms if you like but they had to be um uh, uh, orchestrated with this sort of this kind of big stretch of octaves and i kept thinking you know years later i like i really want to hear them with just the violins but i thought so so i had to write this piece uh, uh, to make that happen. It's but in operas have a way because of their very scale of um, at the, as a sort of, not a black hole is the wrong word, but like a whirlpool or something like that, that sucks everything into it. But what can happen is that you have everything you've, you've written, it's, it, almost anything that can be used uh, ends up in the piece and even things that you haven't written, but they come from the past, you remember. But what can also happen is that something that's actually potentially you could make another quite good piece out of just ends up you know, being washed away and appearing once like a kind of you know useful cow in a flood somewhere and you just see it go past and in this uh, so in this instance i just wanted to rescue this bit for, of debris uh, from from the storm <laughs> of of the uh, of the opera and um, it, it it's uh, it's used as variations sometimes just presented and sometimes with the refraction technique uh, that we mentioned and in another place i actually turn it into a sort of big um uh chacon by unspooling it as a series in some way that i can't now quite reconstruct and you actually even i remember were explaining to me the how how the voice leading and some in the rules of even these three measures determine which which voice moves moves where how many how many steps oh. and that this is how this harmony was generated or am i well, when you when you when you're in the thick of working on something like that you get very familiar with those properties and they do have that's another thing that it, it, you know you you can have quite a lot of material that is sort of if you, if you like applying for entry to a piece um, and in my case, I, I will scribble something down if it looks, looks promising, tear it off and stick the piece of paper to the wall physically. And they can sit there, um, sometimes for years and never make it into anything. And sometimes they suddenly have the, their moment. Um, and I say, oh, you, you're doing <laughs> But when you live with a particular thing like that for a long time in detail, you, you get to know these peculiarities of the often voice leading and how they, how the, I suppose it's really how the ge genetic material works, actually. I mean, it, I don't know enough about that, but I think it's a close, um, the, and there are dangers sometimes, you know, if you if you move uh, in a certain direction on, on the wrong note, you can end up with something that sounds false or isn't, isn't quite itself. 
and um, that was the case with, with, with a lot of material in the Tempest. And I got to know it after two or three years working on it. Wait a minute, we don't, we, we, we shouldn't put that note in that voice because you're going to end up with a problem. It could be a problem of, and it's hard to, you just know instinctively at the time. And, and then towards the end of it, I've had this process happen many times that things start to fall into place that just refuse to for months in the sketches just something that would absolutely not sit in the right place and then i i get to know the material better and realize that i needed to start such and such a process you know six bars earlier and then it then it works out that sort of thing you said that, and things it doesn't necessarily mean it's good but it does just mean that you, it's some kind of confirmation of a of a structure that you get you do get a sense that this structure kind of existed uh, before you were aware of it that's which is strange yeah, so it, uh, it, it develops its own language, so there is the next logical wor word in some way, sounds like I, it's like a crossword almost. I, I suppose it's also, I think it's quite, it's quite, it's a confirmation of one thing, which is that one's recognised one's own piece, one's own material. Because I think recognition comes into it as well. Some things just, you know, don't, they, they could just be... Um, passes by that you don't notice but then if, you, if you've recognized a characteristic that this is this is me um, 100 percent and if I if I work on it it will be me growing something that's if you like growing growing a piece together so with luck you know you recognize the right things <laughs> Yes. I remember yours. I, I found it also very moving when you said uh, in one of our I think joint interviews that you you're explaining how it's looking for what is the next right or fitting note to write down and the next and the next and then you said after you go through this process finally the whole piece if it's a good piece has this inevitable quality that it, that note had to follow this and so on and so forth and then eventually you have the the piece well, that's, that's that quite way. a strange thing that inevitability because it, it, the thing is when one's starting and a lot of the time working if only it was inevitable. I mean, it really isn't. But you, you, what you're working very often for me, it's a process of elimination, and it would be you know, this direction is too, you know, it's whatever, too obvious, too well travelled. It just what happens is it it doesn't stick, and then, you know, that's why you need time. I need time for most things. It's happened very rarely that I've sat down in one go and written something that I then haven't really, there hasn't really been any note that I'd want to change or I feel that I could have done differently at one sitting. It's happened once or twice. But what can happen is I'll do something very quickly and then leave it for however long. Um, and then you start to see the things that will never do and you work on those. But then sometimes there can be a moment when one, one makes a particular, possibly quite spontaneous shift and then weirdly, two weeks later, that has absolutely unchangeable. It's, it's, it's become something that's outside you and has its own determination, like a sort of a kind of stubborn child who will not do it any other way. And that's very, very helpful. And frequently that is a pointer to the genetic habits, the, ge the genetic nature of that particular piece. And what, you know, that odd thing that happened, it has to move with that particular interval or whatever it does it's done it might be something that if i analyze it it gives me a scientific uh principle that can be quite uh helpful later on <laughs> but then you can then you can break your own theories <laughs> at, at your own risk sort of so. well. but, but no but you i mean i think that that's the thing that the, the breaking itself becomes a a principle <laughs> the way that it breaks that's often the case with 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 me, you know, or that I, that's what I sometimes happen with 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 uh, uh, and th there's a period when I w was fascinated by I say tonal harmony, meaning specifically uh, perfect cadences and all that business, um, and I thought what what happens if I treat it not as an inevitable you know kind of uh, a natural process that 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 that, that whatever uh it must do that but i look at those things as a as a structure and um so there it's a third inversion so if, if you have the, that chord c major 
and the next one. So the relationship between those two th things. If you abstract it a little bit, you st you see that you have three voices. One move, they and they one moves major second. One moves minor third. One moves major third. And then the next uh, lord, the next geometrically, the next chord is is not is 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 actually that, which is. Uh, and so I, it's a very simple thing, and uh, um, that's the opening of my piano quintet. Uh, but actually, it's music that, uh, uh, and you could move it around. So all of those chords have a relation, has a, a geometrical relation as well. So uh, uh, um, and on and on if you transpose, and then and the the piece was. I was really an attempt to use that as a basis for a Beethovenian sonata structure, but in my uh, language that would be used, it would modulate and move according to my so-called rules, which the rules are not rules, they're kind of paths that you lay down for the material to go or wander over or ignore at its own uh, will. Um, and this kind of... Um, uh tonal, not exactly tonal, geometric uh, way of moving about with harmony. Uh, are there some examples uh, in the earlier roots, in the earlier composers that you feel um, sort of pushed in this direction or was this always so a tendency? It's, it's all that, it, all the earlier music is that, if you look at it a certain way. You have to look at it, look at really what, look really what they, they're doing rather than what you think they're doing. And it just depends where you draw the line. But I mean, to to a Haydn, I would say that the early Beethoven music would have sounded, in my word, geometrical some of it, because there's such insistence on on the sort of um, these odd relationships between uh, uh, tonic and dominant. It's not convent. The conventions are broken. You know, to them, it would. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying. So I don't see the distinction between the the tonal and the geometrical i just i'm just trying to look at it really look hard at what's what is actually happening in that world but i mean and i i have i'll see if i can find it somewhere on the telecom it might be somewhere here um there's a, a bit where uh the second subject i was actually looking at beethoven i'm going to find it now but the beethoven pastoral sonata you know uh, the, uh, because the second subject of that has this wonderful um unfolding endless role to it and I, I etc um, but and my aversion had to be um, uh, uh, um, Which doesn't actually sound like Beethoven at all. It sounds closer to sort of foray or something like that. In it, you might say, in fact, it's impossible in either of those composers. But all I was doing was seeing what, in order to in order to achieve something like that that, that he was doing, that had that inevitable uh, uh, flow to it, like something that would spiral, you know, like a vine down a drain pipe. I had to. Uh, if you like, break it, the harmony and, and move to my own r r rules. Uh, uh. That that modulation um, is is in by by my rules. And then what I did was make it so that the piano had to uh, do this figuration that's actually in a different series of uh, time signatures underneath. And that way, I'd really get into the. It's an enharmonic en thing. I could not have made it more difficult for myself. <laughs> this particular page, which is why I was sure to have it repeat. And, uh, <laughs> um, yes, and um, this um, so motivic uh, structures that fascinate you, these so smaller creatures. Um, is this then a way of how you think about the larger scale structure of the piece also? It's generated by these so smaller creatures or uh, mm. what, what are your um, thoughts, sensations and plans on, you know, when you are, when you are building these 
large structures from your operas to the concertos to to any extended pieces you know that can be a that can actually be a question of how in harmony i am with myself or with the piece because you know there's an ideal world in which the the, the two are not separable that it has to uh, the the material has has, has I think we lost your sound for a second. Uh, one second. Somehow we stopped hearing you. Say something again. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm muted. You, you can hear me. Yes. Okay. So uh, just be. Uh, so what I was saying that that is a question of um, uh, how many, in harmony I am with myself. Did I say? Did you hear that part? That's the last we heard. So I was saying, so in an ideal, there might be an ideal world in which if you're completely in harmony with your material, that the, the structure develops as an inevitable result of that material and what it wants to do, right? And, and, and with hindsight, that's how things appear. Like if you look at a great movement of Beethoven or Sibelius or somebody, that, that material had to uh, create that particular shape and that particular structure. But I'm pretty sure in both those cases, for example, it was the result of a lot of uh, uh, very heavy breathing and cursing and being covered in um, coal dust and, you know, being a mess, I think. Um, is, uh, uh, and it, it, I have felt that if one, you, you, I think the answer is it's probably a little bit parental, like you, you, you in, in order to make the thing have its own, uh, you know, flourish according to its own lights, there has to be a certain amount of pushing and training it, it somewhere. I mean, if, if you know, because, um, for example, na nature uh, left to its own devices will possibly, one thing it can do is ramify endlessly. And uh, that while interesting in the possible, uh, as, a, as, a, um, uh, uh, as an exper experimental thing, uh, that's not art. <laughs> So the question of what is that, I mean, but it's, so, it's, so, it's just, you, you, you know, but there's about, in, in order to get the different elements, because there will almost certainly, very few things only have one element, there's usually two, the, you know, what if you, like, they used to call it masculine and feminine in the old days, um, just for the sake of argument, we could call it green and blue, uh, or whatever. Um, but uh, the, in order to get those things to, to settle, to live with each other in a structure, uh, you may uh, be cert a certain amount of um, uh, uh, bullying has to, has to happen, or whatever. It's not bullying, but or it could be, you know, um, it could be persuasion or that sort of thing. I I'm, I'm tend to be more persuasive if I can uh, than bully. Um, but uh, there's a length of time, you know, the, the, the um, it's not about it's about scale i think that's what it is it's to get the the the, the small the the microscopic things the microscopic cells to live comfortably in the bigger scale uh, uh you uh, the, the relation of the scale has to be um has to be uh, worked on um and still to 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 dwell a few more examples that i know of and i'm sure i'm sure you possibly have yours but um the three mazurkas that you and i have recently so uh communicated on in depth uh i think it would be fascinating i always enjoy it and i think it would be fascinating for um uh, the, our uh, listeners today to know how how this got refracted uh, and which which chopin mazurkas because i think that's um i find it uh incredibly fascinating i can put these up on the screen as well and so everybody can see because it's it's very it's very uh genially hidden uh which which models you're referring to but um but the chopin is certainly there i mean chopin was my kind of really my earliest classical composer that i suppose that i really fell heavily in love with i used to i used to love listening to schubert before but Chopin, something, something sort of opened um, within me. And I even started writing pieces that uh, uh, I discovered later were actually bits of Chopin polonaises that I'd forgotten were by him. And I was convinced it was by me. Um, uh, and that's when I'm, you know, eight, that sort of age. Whatever. So, 
and one of them is I, the mazurkas always fascinated me because they they're eerie you know they are the Chopin mazurkas are strange things and there's I could I suppose it was I could tell there was something happening that was not just what was it directly in front of you that, that music has just such a hinterland to it such a sort of sense of mysterious spaces in the distance I don't know whether you agree but yeah I, I, now now, you know, now my, I just think that when you hear listen to Chopin you it's like being in some sort of water where you the bottom the the bottom of the bed you know seabed is never really visible it may just occasionally and by which I mean you know the tonality is very often so far down that you're actually just swimming um, and it's not the internal or anything like that, but it, uh, and it's also mostly like that. You know, the mazurkas are just what is that going on with those pieces? So, the, so what? So my mazurkas. Um, the first one, I uh, let me see. Is it um, the the one that goes? <laughs> But then this is amazing. Uh... Well, you see, that, that, I mean, from, I would say that was the first time that particular noise has been heard harmonically in, in a classical context. Who, who, it means surely it's folk music of some kind of fantastic out of tune drone or some, you know, does he? That particular idea of um, having a flat, a, a, a seventh, but then being, being a suspension of that nature. I just, you know, when I heard it, I thought, well, that's something else. That's from another planet. Also in the middle of such a jolly mazurka <laughs> to have this sound. So I thought, I suppose I, the, first, the first place I started with this one was to have um, the, the sound. <laughs> that immediately starts to slither away from its own, but use that as the tonic. So that's where, I think that's probably where that started. That and one. the middle episode is referring to one as well, yeah. or this is uh, uh... I get the, I get the feeling that's a, not so much a specific, maybe it's the same one. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 yeah, maybe that. I can't remember. It's just mazurka. And then, of course, uh, in the second one, it's quite well hidden. Which uh, which one? Uh, which one you're so referring to? A hypersonic uh, space in three different uh, layers of time. It's it's so obvious to me, but it's a, it's a one. It's an, another uh, mazurka. Well, I have you to explain. <laughs> No, sorry, it's another one that is just... Again, it does two very different things, doesn't it? Do you remember what number it is? It's at C major, isn't it? Um, uh, the Chopin. Yeah, I mean, I can remember how it goes. The, um, um, uh, with the... Uh, uh. That one. Um, uh, uh, how does mine go? Uh, um... Again, it seems to exist in this uh, sort of completely outdoor harmonic space. I mean, it, it's just all over A minor, D minor, where it's actually it's in C major. And um, even though you have this, which is <laughs> sort of denaturing the tonic and the dominant completely, so they just become like a sort of I'll squeeze box and that's all it is. <laughs> Which, so you're already in this space where it, nothing is solid. So I thought, well, what if if we if we say um, uh, if we say that um, the second beat is not there, but that what happened was you 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 split, I suppose the atom or whatever the botanical thing would be that the the the, um, the little bit of Chopin that I've taken what's it called when you take a, a cutting from a plant uh you split it at that particular place and then the, the, the my piece begins to grow out of it I suppose you know and and in the, the model was 
the third, and then, yeah, the third one, and, well, it's that sound as, as Chopin has the, um, uh, 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 this, this sort of C sharp minor sound that he has. I mean, that's a waltz, not a mazurka, but there's a particular mood that he has. Chopin actually always, there is some waltz in the mazurka, and there's some mazurka in the waltz, almost. Well, what's the difference? One. I mean, it, it, and, and also, I mean, Chopin waltzes are so much more kind of emotionally. I mean, I mean, they vary from ela elation to total sort of <laughs> suicidal <laughs> objections. <laughs> suicidal horses. Um, uh, but the, the, the third one, yes, that's right. And that sound, and also the particular, uh, in, uh, uh, the, this... Uh, and also this... The, This is, it's things that are slightly against code in the way that he, that the Americans would say, the way that he, in his building structures, you know, if you, if you put that there, uh, you know, reality has slight, is, is blurry there, it's dissolved. There's something in the picture using, it's not quite real what you're seeing. And uh, the, the middle section of it, again, one where he takes, um, uh, uh, an extraordinary, uh, completely like changing a channel uh, on the television for the middle section. It's an A-flat major mazurka. Which has this, uh, the middle section of four bars. <laughs> An A major for no reason at all. So I used that in my as, as an idea that it felt it felt to me that narratively it's something from a novel where you you hear the bells of a distant British church down the you know, the valley or something and you think oh you know we should be there or whatever there's something happening maybe the the, the yeah my but a very fanciful idea maybe the the girl he actually loves is sort of actually getting married and he's trying to forget about it by going up into the hills and dancing the mazurka I don't know so my one that has this section. Uh, um, uh. Yeah, uh, so, uh, which is like bells, um, a tintinabulation of bells. And I, I just, I wanted it to do something that was unrelated apparently to mm. the rest of the mazurka, but then it would just simply go back into it without, without really asking Answer, without really answering questions that might be there. That's another great thing I love about Chopin. He doesn't stop to answer logical questions. So it's a very good, that uh, to me is a, is a very good model. <laughs> uh, but thank you for answering so many of my questions that hopefully are also in the minds of other people that are involved with your music. And since in the second Mazurka, um, you already started talking about one of the aspects that I think would really be interesting to hear your thoughts on uh, people are writing about it. it's interesting to see that even orchestras i think compared to 10 15 years ago are ever more comfortable with the way you notate um time but if we use the example which also i'll put up on the screen if in seven days uh, as just one of the many places where you have this play this hear that and <laughs> and often these questions come with the uh, with the so-called uh, irrational meters. I don't know if they're so irrational, but that seems to be a term that has been anointed by, uh, by somebody. Um, but it would be interesting to, to hear how you, um, how you talk about, um, how, how you um, think about notation and especially sort of the, um, the core of that, where that comes from. Um, yeah, I think that was when I first did that in my piano quintet. Uh, this is uh, you, you using you know, numbers of triplets or quintuplets or whatever that don't add up to the full bar or, and that don't add up to a full set of beats. It's um, it's an idea that, it, it, that, 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 that notating it like that actually makes the idea very simple which in actual fact, mathematically, can become, as I discovered, very quickly, extremely complex. I think the, you, I think the you, example is maybe from the second, uh, uh, second day. 
Oh, with this terrible though in the piano part. Well, that was a that was yeah. That, <laughs> well, that was really setting myself up um, for a fall. But it was terribly complicated. I, what I wanted there was for the piano part to uh, have its own sense of logic rhythmically. Essentially, it's uh, a cadenza that's notated and and and, go, and goes with the orchestra. But it was somehow very important because the music is about geology there. I had to have more than just a sense of free. I wanted inside it to have the complexity of uh, strata of geological, you know, of rock. So as to create, because what's happening in that in that movement is the creation of the um, of rock and the splitting of the earth and the sky. And so it wanted it to sound like the formation of the Himalayas or something like that. So in order to have that, the, you, the, the piano part structure really had to be have this weird quartz-like or crystal-like uh, um, quality to it, something very irregular, but that was totally solid. So I gave myself this ludicrous time signature. The rest of the orchestra is in 4-4 four, four, and the piano is in something that I don't know where it came from, but it was a sort of thing. Um, but that's a slightly extreme example because, I, you know, because normally if you're using a, a two six bar or whatever, it's really no more than you know, Bernstein's America or something. Uh, but instead of ba 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 ba, it would be ba 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 ba, and then the, the first thing starts again. But well, I guess I, I guess for that, since you refer to the two six, which has been so prominent in the uh, in the in the concerto, we can look uh, for for a second even to the um, to the opening of the uh, of the concerto that has immediately some. Uh... You know it better than I do. Yes, well, <laughs> no, you know it better. Uh, so, uh, but there, one immediately sees the the two sixes, and um, but to me, and tell me, tell me if if you disagree with. Um, to me, eventually, all this seeming complexity just um, appears to be your way of notating sort of organic rubato flow that's not uh, dictated by sort of symmetrical lampposts. Yeah, it can be. It's um, also part, I think it, some of it does stem from my it, it, my natural impatience that <laughs> like when we looked at in, in the in, in, in example from Inferno, where I just I can't be bothered to repeat a note and other time just because that's the time signature. And then I thought, well, what happens if I just simply take that note out? I remember thinking this uh, the first time I did it. I said, well, you're then left with a bar that is an irrational number. It's incomplete. It's four triplets or whatever it was. And then I thought, great, yeah. <laughs> let's see what happens if I do that. So then the, that becomes an inherent part of the of the of the structure. With the piano quintet, I really painted myself into a major problem because I had this idea that, that every time somebody else came in, they'd not only be lower down in pitch by a semitone, they would also be slightly slower. So it was like a Doppler effect. And therefore, what was a two-six bar in the violin part had to become a two-five bar in the viola part, while the violin was going on on triplets. And that, at that point, you are really going to another level of um, uh, maths. And uh, I, I learned quite quickly now, early on in a piece, to watch out with the material. If I go down that particular road, it's absolutely fine, but you're going to be in there for a while. <laughs> well, it's isn't that like uh, this uh, double T? Uh, here, where uh, I mean, it's not it's not a Doppler effect, but but you are uh, in the concerto. Yeah, you put yourself, as you said, quite into uh, sort of a, a spiral where you yourself said that you weren't sure whether there is an exit from from that. Oh yes, that was a, yes, that's right. And that was a, that was a, yes, that was it. It was yeah, yes, exactly. It was like climbing up at that thing in a cartoon where, where somebody's frantically climbing up a staircase which keeps sort of disappearing as they're getting up trying to get somewhere uh trying to get uh, about to fall down a cliff and you have to try and get back up onto the top and then um or like the image of the influent hercules with the snakes that i gave you when you were trying to learn it there's also the there's also the uh the the image that i love and i think this is one of the 
things about uh, well the way your mind seems to work uh, there's this sort of genetic structural side but then there's also the the imagery and the imagery at double i that you said that this is like a bunch of ping pong balls being dropped off from the top of the stairs and uh, and yes. uh, they're all dropping but at different speeds which 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 i think is uh <laughs> is, it seems to be very apt with these uh uh, yeah. symmetrical, asymmetrical number of triplets and, and eighth notes. It's reminding me of when I, when I was very young, because I think that movement is about the youngest kind of childhood play and the way that children play, that completely the world that they create. Apparently, I, the first time I came across gramophone records, you can imagine what I when I sat at the top of the stairs, took them all out of there things and rolled them down, <laughs> threw them down the stairs. So, um, that's, that's possibly pruning. that's one way of pruning <laughs> wasn't popular but here we are. oh and can we put this to to rest because one uh because it's not at rest uh this is uh as you said this isn't some uh quote or reference to i got written by gershwin i never oh. thought it was you said it isn't one reads that it that 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 people perceive it to be but we can put oh, it but in. i mean it's fine i mean it's of course it's it, but it's very much it's quite what's quite funny about that is that it's perceived as a syncopation uh um just from the result of having one beat on the timpani um i mean it, it's very much not from i got rhythm i didn't even think about it but uh it's a the, the, it's a perfectly fine I, I i actually collect those moments when somebody says of course you're you're quoting from such and such and uh that isn't a quotation and I may even be quoting from something else that's often happened that I, there's something else buried um, but it, it's almost never the thing that that, that that someone thinks it is but then you know all of our minds are kind of um, haunted libraries and uh, so those things are there in some way or other so I, 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 absolutely fine <laughs> it's obviously something lots of people have agreed on but that's tuned but I, it, it was uh, impossible to say I'm not using that because it sounds like I've got rid of it thank god you used it um and i think one one more before i ask you about other things and and you'll tell us about other things the not the quotation but a certain reference that i love uh that you say is um buried in there and once you sh when you showed it to me it is rather on the surface is in powder her face and i know that's a piece that interests uh, a lot of a lot of people here in, in the in the paraphrase but obviously also in the in the opera, it's the your your uh, reference to to Mussorgsky and to the oh, yeah. to this uh, cadencing that is, uh, I think, uh, in this section, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's very. Um, I mean, that's a proper reference that that, that comes. It's an operatic reference. I mean, the, the, it, in the sense that I'm really pointing out that this character, the hotel manager, is a figure of of of, of her of her death um, at the end in a very obvious way. But you, using the the end of the lullaby, each verse of the songs and dances of death, um, it just it just so happened that that's where my tune was going, and I just thought, I, okay, that's I'm having that. Because... With this. Yes. 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 Ah, yes. <laughs> and then at the end, of course, bye, Ushki, bye, you, bye, you. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. And um, and then perhaps uh, so. It, what often happens? Sorry, I was just thinking. Yeah. What often happens with those things? It can be when um, my own material, which all all of that music is my own stuff I was working on at the time. But it, it can sometimes edge so close to something odd, odd or remarkable in, in an existing thing. And I remember that in that period, uh, I would think, shall I actually let that one fall in? Oops, you know. And so often I would do. I mean, there's, there, there are other things in the piece that are like that. So uh, it, because it's dramatically a big, a big finger saying, you know, he's dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and this, um, since we are on the subject of um, so roots, uh, seeds, and life cultures, obviously you have um, you have a piece like Powder Her Face that you've made uh, many uh, different, uh, or you've dressed it into many different guises, and uh, and then you have the 
piece that's originally for cello and piano and then became a piece for cello and orchestra, the, uh, the piece uh, for yeah. Stephen, uh, who I think is here today. Uh, hi, Stephen. Uh, and uh, do the notes sometimes wish, wish to change? Or for you, this is really dressing a piece. For example, if you, as, you, as you went from um, powder her face, paraphrase from one piano to two pianos, or from the cello piano to cello orchestra, do, yeah. you, yeah. do you really just dress it as a different orchestration or? No, these, these, are, these are different things. Okay. I mean, the, the, in the Lira Trouvé is definitely an orchestration of the piece. I, I very much uh, don't change the notes you know, beyond what's necessary for instrumental range or whatever, but uh, it's definitely the same music as in the case of your berceaus from uh, the Exterminating Angel, you know, taking a string uh, orchestra and two singers and turning it into a piano piece. I don't change the notes, you know, but you might change the spacing and you get into all sorts of other things and it's interesting. But the paraphrase was something else because, um, first of all, that was really the idea of uh, that you get, I think, in Liszt, and I think of coming home from a night at the opera, having made a strong impression. You don't have the score, but you sit down and you try and remember, you know, how Rienzi went or how that tune went. And that's the, the, the conceit is that you're doing it from memory. And I'm, I'm dead, that one, I was literally trying to uh, remember my own opera, I don't know, however many years later or 15 years later, and just sort of splashing through it. I just somehow found that was big, because I think that piece, I found it had a certain kind of unstoppable momentum to it, but it still goes on kind of uh, uh, ca cascading through my brain, in my own brain, like some, some kind of waterfall years later. And then as the water goes past, the music goes past, I'll notice certain things that, hang on, that, that's quite, you know, that could join up to there, that could be quite interesting because, you know, the narrative of the opera is very jumpy. It jumps many decades suddenly backwards and forwards, backwards once and forwards. Uh, but uh, that means sometimes that musical processes get deliberately uh, cut off in a very dra dramatic or violent way, um, which is, uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm very happy about that. But uh, I, I just thought if one had a paraphrase, you could link things together and it would be more like a, a, a rem reminiscence, you know, a rem like a reminiscence of Norma, that piece of list, or that wonderful there, what's it called, La Traviata one, is that right? Um, uh, so it would it would be more, but, but, but remembering my own piece, and it, it, it links to a certain kind of uh, virtuoso tradition as well. That, that I'm very, I'm, um, I'm very much appeals to me. The sort of mystery of finding something that maybe again that is not deliberately the original thing is not exactly settled. It, it doesn't settle it, but it's the whole thing is still all alive and it's still in there. So that means it's very fruitful for, you know, um, for new things. And plus final thing is it's written the original opera for an extremely fragile, strange instrumentation. Um, and so in some ways there's an act, act of uh, rescue and going back in down the mine and helping out some very fragile little moments that are almost always inaudible in an opera house. And while you mentioned uh, Liszt and we're on that subject, and I want to ask you more about the ballet that should have been premiered, but we can still say now it's upcoming. Um, but you once said to me a phrase that struck me, and I think wonderful phrase, in defense of uh, Liszt, that Liszt in many ways showed uh, not only the way of being a virtuoso, but the way of being a composer and the way of being a musician. And I'd love for you to... Um, to capitulate that or elaborate on that, uh, because because obviously we do know that Liszt is so easily still dismissed uh, by too many uh, as um, virtuosic music, and that somehow uh, often comes with a derogatory connotation. But you obviously don't feel that way, and even your new ballet's first part is very much um, in touch with Liszt. Well, there's a fascinating honesty to the way uh, Liszt composed. He, it's a, I suppose, highly spontaneous and brilliantly artistic at the same time. So you have, I think, his senses are always fully engaged. When I mean, you can just sense, you can set, sense him sitting at the piano, and coming up with, you know, whatever the chord might be, with this sound that has never previously been heard. Um, uh, um, <laughs> just immediately think no, you know n nobody's moved from a diminished seventh it, 
in that direction before. And you can sense the sort of, oh, there's a new sound. And it remains new. And that's why, I mean, I haven't actually used that one, but there are plenty of people who did. Wagner is behind me. <laughs> um, and that's why I think the, the thing remains very much alive. Or that I, 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 maybe an easier way to put it with the, the sonata, it's there's only one list sonata and there can only be one list sonata you wouldn't say you know there wouldn't be three list sonatas because that's his way of saying a sonata must be as Marta would say uh, an expression of your relation to the universe and it happens once you know um, I, 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 rather than a sort of Brahms idea of having three sonatas or whatever it is that you you you, you can just it, it really is that sonata is like a lifetime you know, the, the, some kind of extraordinary hero. But Liszt is a declamatory composer. It's really that it's very 19th century. So it's almost a spontaneous declamation. And um, that I think is what makes it so alive now. Uh, it's really like opening a, it, turning on some extraordinary channel. And this, these things are happening all the time. It's very alive, like a constant news newscast. I can't remember what I said before, but that's what I'm saying. Oh, before. you know, the, the different reincarnations of your uh, your thoughts on Liszt are, are wonderful to have. Well, it, uh, yeah, it's funny because the the, the, the the Inferno, which was premiered last year, list, and then I, there's no list after that. Once you get to Purgatorio, because uh, uh, I wanted so to I, ask you if you're if you're not going to break some non-disclosure agreement, can you? Because I, you've talked to me a little bit about what might be in the Purgatorio and the Paradiso. Are you? Uh, loud and willing to talk about it or rather well, I can, yeah no i mean it's it would be out there uh, <laughs> and now it's going to be we hope you know you know all the problems but we hope next year but one thing that happened having having got to this point of um is it ventriloquizing or something with with list um talking somewhere through through his music and then out of it and into my own um i took the next step of you know the next plan through of window uh, of actually having recordings of past music, which is uh, 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 religious uh, songs from the Addis Synagogue in Jerusalem. So that is my, you know, name, and it's from there. So I feel like I can. Um, but uh, and uh, just little snatches of these. It's a rather strange ancient tradition of prayer, sung prayer, and the whole congregation. Of it. And they are uh, very fascinating and strange things. I've only used tiny little bits, but just there's something about having the actual singing uh, itself and moving between that, something that's happened a long time ago, which is a recording in itself of something that has gone back many centuries probably, if not a bit more than that, who knows, um, in Syria. Uh, and uh, then bringing it into a, a modern orchestral context and the way, the way, I, the way you get in and out of it and it's making explicit this idea that when you are writing, you're digging down, possibly, you're, whether you dig down or not, you, your roots can go deeper than you. you. I mean, that could, could beyond, beyond, if you like, the cradle. I mean, beyond my li own lifetime. Of course, all these things are, you know, Hestel, Beethoven, but really deep back into the sort of common soil. That's what it is. And uh, actually, for, the, for those that uh, haven't been to the other synagogue in Jerusalem, it's a very beautiful, small synagogue. And it's, uh, uh, from what I understand, a very s it's a center of a very special kind of, uh, kind of uh, cantor singing. And people come from all over the Middle East to, to study that more ancient uh, manner that you refer to. And I think if one goes in the winter, we discussed this, if one goes in the winter, there apparently so to say, jam sessions at something like two in the morning of the different cantors that, that gather from, from everywhere in the world. So we have to go, uh, no social distancing, it's very small and there's a lot of singing. And, uh, and apparently at two in the morning, this is, this is, this is where it's at with, with cantorial singing. I, I, interesting, I have a suspicion some of the recordings I've used may be done in, at the, in those circumstances, actually. <laughs> And, uh, and, and what's, what's Paradiso? What, what does this all lead to? Oh, Paradiso is uh, very different. I suppose that's, if you like, that's really uh, Addis, as in this one. Um, it's much more geometrical. And I've really gone to town in my obsession with spirals. But it's also, 
I, I, what I like about the Dante Paradiso is it's not the endless list of, 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 of virtuous people, but it's the uh, slightly eerie, spooky, growing sense of infinite amounts of light. So yeah, I looked at Dore, Gustave Dore's pictures of angels where you, you have a very literal anatomical angel with wings, but then the next one gets smaller and then it gets smaller as well. And by the end, there's just a sort of dots and dots of white light. And that's what I've uh, tried to do with Paradiso over about 25 minutes. Um, and I, 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 you know, I'm looking forward to hearing hearing that one. Um, but it does end with a, a kind of, I mean, you might call it C major or whatever that, that 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 sort of those words mean. It's not actually that, but it's something like that. So you just think C major is sort of the foundational chord versus any other, or it just came out that way <laughs> by, by by virtue of uh, saying yeah, that. I, um, I don't think that. I think the C major is the people's key. Okay, and paradise is for well for some people. Um, <laughs> one has some of those people. Um, tell me, um, obviously, your relationship to music is um, so multifaceted. Aside from, or in addition to, your composer's relationship to music, um, you are an incredible pianist, a wonderful conductor. Um, what is when you start playing your own music to start with that? Uh, <laughs> can you, do you continue playing as a composer or do you become an interpreter? And so, what kind of duality arises there, or it's not a duality at all for you? I mean, you, you have to slightly leave your composer uh, uh, in the cupboard when you're playing because you can't go on. I mean, you, it would be like a lawnmower running a mock otherwise. I keep trying to change things and you just have to not do that to yourself or to, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the process of getting these things onto the page uh, is one that I don't want to start repeating at the keyboard on, or particularly not on stage. It's not, it's not right. You know, because it's, a, it's a very private thing that happens in here and there's an awful lot that, I mean, I just know that one decision might take weeks to settle. So I don't, but one thing I can say is I, I can remember, if you like, oh, this is a funny thought actually. I was reading today a wonderful parodist, Craig Brown, but he put this thing very well that he, he teases out the, 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 the the sense in what people have written and brings it back to it, sort of the original nonsense. So I think it's absolutely wonderful because there's, what he's saying, I think, is that before there is there are all these notes on the page and there are all these specific instructions and there's this structure, before that there's a point where there's something more visceral when we talked about music that's hidden that's a realm behind. And I have to remember that it's not just putting one's fingers, you know, down and pressing the buttons and say on the key, it is that. But there's something that this what what that score is is a map of an invisible landscape, an invisible realm, and what you want to create, you want to put the listener, you to 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 put this to put them in that realm when you play. So it's not enough to just you know be absolutely. You, there's much more to it. There's a, a magician, uh, magic ma a magical thing in 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 Lyra Trouve, for example. I, I had this idea that while the cellist is playing, the pianist is playing, you can, they, they, they actually do recreate uh, these landscapes, these four different landscapes for real in a way with the music, you know. So uh, does that make sense? I've forgotten. <laughs> yes, yes. And, uh, and then your relationship, um, so when the piece sort of becomes its own entity, which you often refer to, and it kind of becomes its own thing, then you hear other people be interpreters uh, using using your music, so to say, or this this. Oh, well, you, you know, they're all these little signs and there's rubato here or whatever. All the all the instructions are in some ways really to be understood as almost like a kind of side long glance saying you, you know you do get this don't you that, that why you know there has to be a diminuendo here that's why it says diminuendo it's like if you're understanding the music there will be a diminuendo so it's not because you don't just do it because it's written dim in the, in the score so as you you know so we uh, so there's got to be they're they're really kind of like little shibboleth little little um 
signs like masonic signals if you get it you, you sort of get it if you understand why that's there you're you're in on the you you speak the language you know yes or to uh to quote i think this was already once quoted to quote to quote uh uh a wise hungarian man known to us that that the, the translation of what you just said is don't be an idiot that uh, <laughs> well, that all, well, all the would... things of the composers are essentially saying don't be an idiot which don't be an idiot you more, more mean, politely you're idiot. saying yeah. well you do get what's happening yes i just i just see if, you, if one's in sympathy with 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 my language and why, why should you be but uh, you know but with any luck if you're playing it um you you will be sort of thing uh, I, I think so. That's that. That I felt. I find that with um, our older uh, colleagues, and older music as well. That very often it's, it's almost like a plea. Like you must see why it says non trouble here. <laughs> you know? I find it sometimes very visionary that they seem to know two hundred years in advance. Just take an example of Beethoven. That somebody will come in two thousand nineteen and will have a natural tendency to play this chord. Yeah. Too loud. And then all of a sudden, the, from two, 200 years earlier, uh, there's a hand saying, no, but don't play this chord loud. And the same, yeah. so this kind of providence of, uh, of, of knowing what the people will do. Well, well that's, that brings us back, actually, to some, something that fascinates me, that I can't think of, you know, yes, it's 200 years ago, but actually it's now. These things are, are immediately now. This is what I think the core of what we've been saying is that, that these things are not in the past. You can't think of them as a sort of museum way. I don't, I don't you know, they're, they're ancient old books of music, but that's when you see it's rather a shock when you hear a piece of Schubert oil to see how old and mouldy the actual books are that they were published in originally. It's a bit, oh, good, you know, the print looks incredibly out of date and you can hardly read it. Because to me, the man is still alive, you know simple as that because whatever the issues were the, the of mapping that, that landscape that he was facing are the same issues that you face today in some respects you know this modern science has had various advantages but in an abstract sense the problem of what to do when you've got tune a and tune b uh, the, the, the rules that operate in those things are very different now from what they were in schubert's or somebody's day but the issues are the same issues that, and so the answers might, with you know, mutatis mutandis, different translations, be the same answers. So that's why I kind of look to them for guidance. <laughs> Which is in a certain way also then uh, the healthy and refreshing way to dispel the whole idea of modern music, or rather that there is modern music versus old music that so often so, so, in the programs, no? Well, it's a hilarious uh, 20th century kind of chic thing that, and obviously, you know, the the, the actual, you know, the, the, the qualities of um, what the music's going to sound like. I mean, I don't necessarily need it to be, you know, just to be, uh, when I say it's about structures, that can sound rather dry and abstract, and I don't mean that at all. You know, if you decide that all of your painting has to be only grey or black and white, you know, that is a fashion decision, you know, it's not anything to do with, with modernity or otherwise, it's just that's a chic thing of that era, you know what I mean? But you know, I think that the crucial thing is one, one must completely forget one's era in a way, and then it, it'll be there anyway, you can't help, you can't escape it, it'll be in the music anyway, in some way or other, so don't make it a sort of fetish, what I'd say. I don't like to. Well, maybe you do. It's a matter of taste. Modern, mod, modernism is a matter of taste. But. Well, I remember you're saying that uh, that you that you want to be that um, not the designer of fashion for the for the millions and for the masses, but the, <laughs> but the sort of custom dressmaker that makes the three dresses that whose design features then trickle down into into the multitude of uh, consumer hits, perhaps. Well, I think if I was making multi millions and millions of mass-produced clothes, I would be involved in so many lawsuits. <laughs> probably. <laughs> it's probably as well. You, know, you can't walk down the street in one of my creators. <laughs> speaking, about, speaking about something more uh, mass, uh, I hesitate to say the word mass appeal, but of uh, you know, targeted more towards the, the masses, uh, you not so long ago, uh, wrote a um, wrote music for 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 a film. 
Oh. And you were telling me that you uh, that this experience was the creative person you are, uh, a learning experience as well. So, um, what have you learned there in that in that foray into film music? What I really loved about that, and I talked about craftsmanship before, is that I am obsessed with these odd questions of, you know, you've got two chords with four notes in each chord. Where does the horn play? Where do they where do they change bows? These sort of questions you're dealing with all the time. And I, I love those. They're simple questions. You have to look at a Tchaikovsky score or a Wagner score or a Puccini score to find different answers to it. And in a film, when you watch it properly, in the cinema, for example, that chord, those two chords, are like the faces of the actors, magnified to 20 feet tall, So you, as it were. So you hear every little detail of that. And that absolutely is music for use, in a way. Um, it's making, uh, if you like, costumes for another person's work of art. And I'm, I see myself just like the costume designer, who will actually be able to express some of their own taste, and they will inevitably be doing so but within the world of that film. And so it, it really appealed to a side of me that, that's the, the craftsman night side. I, I enjoyed that very much. It uh, doesn't leave much room for, um, you know, expressions of me, 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 myself, you know, uh, and nor should it, I think, in that particular case. Another time, if I ever did another one, I might kind of, but the problem is if someone said, I want you to do a real, piece of yours, like a sort of t what, what a piece by Thomas Alice does, you know, in the theatre or in, or in the concert hall in my film. I sort of think, like, I'm not so sure that you do <laughs> because there's a sort of, I, I think you want me to just not, you know, I, I, that's in a different room and this is me, this is another room of the, another room of the, of the palace. Uh, and it is actually more similar to making practical clothing, actually. You know, work clothing, workman like things for sports, and and, and but really are like that. Um, it was a, it was, and I, I very much enjoyed spending so many, having spent so many months and years on my own in the studio with absolutely no one to tell me, you know, actually this this should be a B flat or a B natural. Um, I it was lovely having the director saying, "Can it go up there? Can it go down there?" <laughs> I, I, I missed that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is uh, this practicality is one of the things that uh, that Mr. Schoenberg didn't get with that uh, famous uh, attempt of his to try to write a movie movie score where he thought that first he writes the piece and then they'll shoot the movie. Uh, oh no! Wonderful. Yes, I must have complete artistic control. You know, Mr. Goldwyn, or whatever it was he said. Um, yeah, no, but I was thinking the other day actually. All the, I mean, I'm, I'm a bigger uh, cinephile and, and fascinated by the way scores work and. and but, all the work that's been done in that, I still think the most powerful score is, uh, it's going to sound very clear, but is um, The Third Man, where there's no orchestra, you know, the director just wandered into a cafe in Vienna, and there was Anton Karras with his zither, and the whole score is only that, but it's just so emotionally shattering and complex, and just, I mean, it's just, it's just brilliantly used, and it, it's, it's, you know, popular art. Par excellence, but all those glorious sort of rich film scores with orchestra, I still think they, they, that has never been approached for how powerful that score is. So that sort of tells you something, doesn't it? <laughs> Certainly does. Um, yes. to, there's there are a couple of questions turning to some of the questions uh, from from our participants. Uh, Susanna Westenfelder asked, uh, Mr. Adis, you, you just said during the seminar, the harmony never resolves. In the book Full of Noises, you speak about stability and instability. I tried to figure out what you could mean in particular using these terms. Would you connect these terms to maybe a traditional perspective on harmony? But perhaps maybe if you can give the example of what you mean by harmony that never resolves. Oh, I'm not. I'm, well, that, that was the, I think the harmony that never resolves was the, uh, uh, I was talking about the song that's in The Exterminating Angel where it, it keeps rotating. Um, and you can, of course, say, that you know any kind of major chord is is always potentially just a dominant of something else, and it's only a question of uh, dramaturgy that something does resolve. But I mean, you know, I, uh, that, that that way, if you take that to uh, to an extreme, madness lies. But um, I, I do think that in some ways, whenever I listen to a, a, a great classical uh, composer, especially that period, Haydn and Beethoven. 
um, you can see this always as a kind of like a record of a quest for harmony and a kind of rather disgusting way to put it is is like a quest for re resolution and a disgusting way to put it would be like it's a snail trail <laughs> you know almost but or, but it's something or there are natural examples which are very beautiful like a flower or a tree or that amazing fish that does the patterns on the sand um that it's a, it's in some ways a record a, a record of that composer path looking for a path towards resolution from wherever they started out so um that's what i mean i think that you, you know, they're looking for stability and it can you can have an illusion of it which is that's where the art comes in and uh and there was a question one could say is is uh is related from philip stucker uh you have mentioned spiral spirals several times today could you explain what you mean by a uh, spiral in music and and your fascination of spirals well it can be a number, number of things i mean one one obvious thing in terms of uh, uh, harmony would be uh transpositions that that you know in, infinitely it's with it within um, a progression it it repeats itself but at a different level and that's something that doesn't really happen in the baroque period it's actually quite unusual but i, I do it a lot and i like i like that so it's it's a built-in modulation that keeps going on but then you can then have um other forms of uh, me me melodic spiral that it's so it's essentially a form well you know what a spiral looks like um and things that would go uh, again um that might be like a, a a branch or a vine that that's its natural way of moving but then in order to create something uh, that's that goes somewhere it has to be trained <laughs> to go around a different way but uh, i think it's probably na the nature because because the material i'm, I'm looking at um the uh, let's say tonic dominant in a geometrical way rather than in a narrative way that that does have spiral uh, it will get, move like a spiral if you leave it like if you leave it on its own yeah and uh turning uh, for a minute to the well to car current life and uh and how outside life affects your uh inner life we've spoken a little bit about uh the the lockdown the fact that obviously many things well all performances have been cancelled and thus many for you as well um but of course your primary concentration as you always say is composing and and you've said that you are finding um, some uh, positive sides in this in this period how how is working how has working been in the, in these months of the of the lockdown and the pandemic? Well, of course, losing all the concerts and we were going to do many together um, has been ghastly, of course, and it just it's a, a catastrophe what's happened to music internationally. Just personally, however, um, I suppose on some in some ways, it's, it's somewhere inside me, I've been thinking for years. Oh, I could just do with another couple of months at home. You know, work on that. I, I have been thinking that occasionally. I certainly didn't have in mind that it would come about in such a catastrophic way. Uh, but um, I've made the most of it. Um, and uh, many things that I've been, new pieces I've been meaning to do for years and could never see a window, I've already done two. The, um, uh, revising older ones. Uh, that you know going back and helping some stragglers and, and and taking the rust off and I think many of us have also found that being at home there's a kind of deep housekeeping that's been going on and things that have been meaning to tidy for years and all this sort of thing uh, I, I know many people who found themselves uh, doing that um, and in my case that's been um, applied to my my back catalogue or whatever you want to call it and pieces that I want to rework uh, or add things to and uh, there, there's a I, this could go on another year and I would still have plenty of material uh, uh, to do that god forbid that it does though but just so you know that I, I found uh, in it, it, it again it's um we talked about being catapulted back into the past into childhood and things like that. I felt like I did back when I left university in about 20 21 whatever it was um uh, and I was just just in a room you know writing music basically most of the time um, and it's uh, sent me back to that, actually quite happily, back into that state. Um, I, so uh, there have been, um, in, 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 that, in that sense, uh, it's, 
let's say, I wouldn't say positive, it has been positive, but I would say educational. Mm. And um, you've, you've said to me also when we spoke earlier about um, sort of composing under pressure versus composing now with, well, let's say with a different kind of pressure, but without the same time pressure that you, that you would experience in the, our previous life's rhythm. <laughs> so how, well, how is that different? And what are some of the say advantages and disadvantages of that for you? Well, you'd really be talking about the first couple of months of this uh, uh, business. Um, I would say, oh, I have all the time I need, possibly need. And, and then, of course, it's a slight danger that then I've, it's the, what I call the lawnmower starts you, you might want to work on some other piece but then you can end up throwing out much too much and actually ruin it ruining it or changing you know the, what what the one of the advantages of the real time of the rest of the world actually having its own ideas and its own chronology which you know can be a real bore a lot of the time for a composer for an artist you know why should you have to do the piece for this particular date you know, it's not going to be ready um, but it does have the advantage of uh, keeping you within certain uh, limits you can't be absolutely you could be but i just don't think that's not how i function and but that was that was then and what's quite interesting is i already started taking on much too many new pieces within the lockdown so i think i must i must flourish a little bit under pressure i think it, that was a machine that i possibly let get, get have too much control um but also, you know at the end you have to certain decisions uh, it's quite a good idea to have to take them slightly at the gunpoint of a deadline um you know bernstein said that ideally you just you need not quite enough time and uh and let's say uh taking an example for example of schubert that you referred to earlier so this is somebody that barely heard much of uh, anything that he wrote in, in terms of you know actual physical performance now you said let's say uh, uh, only jokingly that we don't know whether some of these big uh, orchestral pieces that that you're writing uh, will be performed or performed in near future because of the limitations of orchestration size, for example. How, um, how important is it to you as a composer, not as an ambitious person, not as a member of society, but as a composer, how important is it for you to hear the piece actually? Or is, is there a part of you that's perfectly content knowing what you have written and in some way doesn't require a validation of a, of a of an actual sounding i would say this is changing because uh i'm becoming more of a realist a little bit I, the, some of the works i did orchestral particularly and let's say the 90s uh or, or okay um were a fairly for me an extreme of imagining um how an orchestra might be broken up and put together again. And um, that, in, in, in hearing them, uh, there was a certain amount of shock involved. Um, and now I, I understand more, I don't know, I understand this more, you know, the, uh, the, an orchestra is going to remain an orchestra, whatever you, whatever you do to it. It's like the human body, there's a certain, there's only a certain far you can get before, before it turns into something else. And um, so uh, if this does become a kind of, God forbid, permanent or, or longer term reality that we can only have orchestras that are broken up in a certain way and the flutes have to be kind of in the next county or uh, whatever, uh, then that will, I think, have an effect on um, the form of, the, of, of what people are, are, are doing eventually. I mean, you have to, I mean, I, I keep thinking about 1919, uh, 1920 time. Stravinsky sitting with a huge score of Les Nos with 160 players or whatever it was and you know with mechanical symbol on it I don't know what couldn't get it right just doesn't make sense plus the fact that you had first world war Russian revolution and a pandemic and Diagola says you know you got we've got to do this ballet and I can't sit around any longer and no you can't tell all these instruments and no you can't have a flute or horn and, you know, and can't you just produce something for next Wednesday and Shrewsky sort of gets together that version for four pianos and, and percussion, uh, which not only, of course, is the piece we now know today, but completely changed the sound of, of the music made for the whole century. So 
there's that. So, I mean, if, if by, by this time next year, we still haven't worked out how to get um, uh, uh, an orchestra into a pit, I shall just have to produce a version for something else that is uh, sanctioned by our very, very reliable and expert government. And, um, and how, um, how important is the influence of your significant performing abilities that now for everybody are on pause um, to you as a, as a composer? You, do you find that this is also a conduit that sort of um, uh, refreshes the water and, uh, and, and uh, sort of feeds the direction that your music has been taking over these past couple of decades? as you become also a more and more significant and experienced performer? I wonder, I think that, I, I do think these are two different things because the performer can ha have to be a bit more of a well-behaved adult, at least on the surface. And I think the composer needs to guard their sense of childhood play and work quite jealously, quite, kept quite, you know, hard but um what i do like is i'm very lucky to be able to try things out and, but whether i'm playing it here on the piano or somehow put it together in my head or maybe even pick you know pick up a um, an object and start hitting it somewhere else i mean it can be playing around but i think that it, in that sense having your hands practically on the means of making the sound um, I do value that, yes, as a composer. I think that does give me something to have to actually be able to touch and feel all these objects, uh, um, e e even conducting, of course, you're not really making the sound, but, you know, actually you kind of are. Um, so that uh, uh, is, I think, I'm grateful for that one, yeah. And, uh, and teaching, I mean, you, you usually uh, teach at Master Cove. <laughs> Uh, and 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 perhaps at other times during the year a little bit uh, is that uh, is that just charitable work or do you find that that is also another way of you getting to something in terms of musical substance? Certainly not charitable work, except unless it's the people I'm teaching who who uh, give me so much actually by you know whether it's how brilliantly they handle something or sometimes I might think. Oh, that that person really is over pedaling, and I do that, you know. So that that teaches me <laughs> something. So it does. It obviously. I I just uh, I I wouldn't recommend myself as a composition teacher. I think that's a very odd and elusive uh, art and skill. I, and I I, I, um, I think my dear first composition teacher, Erica Fox, um, who was uh, the most wonderful opener of doors, uh, and. Uh, but that was to children and I was 12 or so, 13, something like that. So I don't think, I think that wouldn't, I think if you can't teach yourself composition, you know, it's probably no point. <laughs> well, you once quoted Mr. Kurtak saying that, that, that composition cannot be taught at best, it can be encouraged. Well, it might, I mean, or discouraged is what usually happens. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so, uh, no, I don't, I don't think, um, I, I mean, it's just a problem of time actually teaching. I don't particularly like the sound of my own voice repeating the same old, uh, the same old observations. I, 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 I'm not that. I suppose it's um, that's more of a, a sort of um, educating people in that sense personally. And I'm, I'm not. I don't know. I'm not trained to do that. I don't have the psychological, you know, training. And, uh, and maybe as uh, as we. Uh... As we are uh, making the the circle in our conversation and uh, and uh, drawing drawing the back to the starting point in terms of roots, I remember we once had an interesting conversation uh, about your relationship with uh, specifically with British music and the things that have um, preceded you. Uh, you spoke about, of course, Oli Nassen, uh, Tippett, Britain. Um, what, um, how important is that heritage to you and, uh, and, uh, mm, what are your relationships in some way to the, to the, to, to the music of those composers? 
It's so funny. I, I can't see anything in common between those three, those three people. No, I, well, the only thing in common. <laughs> I mean, the, I know, I know. That's what I. That's what I mean. I remember. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So you are in some way the the common factor, perhaps. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, it's it's it, well. I mean, all I say is that this is not a country that really has, in that sense, you know, it's not like saying German music, whatever that means, you know, it's complicated, but we all know that there is a particular, that there may be a kind of illusion of a sort of narrative point that goes from one one person to another. In Britain, it would be more like uh, working against the general indifference of the <laughs> public. You know, it's what something I find very touching about El El Elgar's as one of such a great composer, but there's a sort of sense that he's saying, listen, 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 you know, and, and uh, the, the influences are much more, uh, not just German but Russian, I think. Uh, I mean, because that was what there was, and um, and what w was popular in England at that time was something else uh, musically, you know, um, light opera and rather well, and Victorian sentimental things. Um, we didn't have what they had in uh, Germany. I don't know. I mean, this is all a bit of a murky subject. I mean, it's why, do you, been why do you think that is uh, in uh, in England particularly this? Uh... Uh, well, you say to quote your words just now that well we don't have that uh, we don't have such a tradition um, because we're barbaric. It's a it's a barbarous island race of first times. I mean, it's also a very complicated place. It's yeah, I won't get into it. It's a complicated mix of peoples and and has it was very busy, you know, um, uh, uh, enslaving the rest of the world for a long time. I I really don't. I, well, I'm much more comfortable if we leap. Colonial, this is the price of colonialism. I'm, I'm much more comfortable if we leap back to just a mile that way, less down the road. Um, Purcell's time, you know, writing the the most glorious music that's ever been written in this country. Uh, when is that? You know, 1680s, 90s. Um, that's the real thing, and I mean, you know, you look at that music, it has Italian influences, it has French influences, but um, it's so absolutely um, English, and the influences are part of that, actually. It's this kind of playing with other people's stuff. Which, which admittedly, has always been the case, this cross-pollination. Yes, but we can't manage without it, I suppose. Yes, but uh, perhaps, perhaps that's, that's far enough away from for me that I, you know that that music is um, just I don't you know, I've never really used it in my own, but I've made transcriptions. But just the kind of spirit of it, I think. And perhaps as we draw to a close, and I know I should uh, I should let you. Uh, I'm always uh, somehow conscious of the fact that whatever time. Uh, one takes of you is time potentially spent away from or distracting you from <laughs> posing and then you know less less uh, wondrous notes for us but it's hard not to ask a general question that i think is very much on everybody's mind um the difficulties of the world pandemic but much many other problems as well the the relevance that well, culture that is certainly under attack, certainly under attack in Great Britain and the United States in various ways. Um, so not even mentioning classical music, but classical music, since we're practitioners of that. Um, how, um, what can we say about its relevance? Or, or, or does, does, does it need to have a relevance? Or is that even the wrong question that's so often Post, or is this just this wonderful, amusing thing that you do for yourself? Put these notes oh, together, and uh, and the rest is whatever the world makes out of it. What is what is your feeling of relevance and relation of, for example, your music and music generally to the outer world with its own, with its big set of problems? Can I press the panic button? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I well, apologize, but it's it is one of those no. questions that I realize at the outset is unanswerable, but at the same time not so. Well, no, no, it's fine. It's, it's, you, know, well. you know, whether whether anybody else wants it or not, I'm going to do it. I'm not, you know, I'm afraid that's what I you know, keeps me. Alive. I mean, I just will do it in the way that uh, um, a spider will make a web. I mean, you have I do it to to live to survive and. Um, we are, uh, we are, I, mean, I see this coming four years ago, I was saying we're entering a new dark age 
and boy, you know, it's got a lot worse since then. And a dark, what happens in the dark age is that artists get get gets uh, sidelined, and people think, "What's the point of that?" And they basically end up forgetting what it's for. And therefore, they start to not be able to uh, read their own um, signs that are around them and not understand their own culture, and then it gets lost. So I feel that that may be happening, but it's absolutely none of my business. I, I just keep on going, doing what I'm doing. I'm an artist. I'm not a social engineer. That's the, you know, whatever that kind of science is. It's not what I do. I just do whatever. And um, in my case, I like the sense of community a little bit. But you know, I'm writing for people who will get it. It's a, there's a there's a special thing of a really sense that oh, I'm, I'm not actually insane, but this is this is speaking to somebody else, and I'm not just babbling away in an invented language of my own, which you feel like you are sometimes uh, while writing it. But I think of somebody like um, one of my favourite composers, Nan Caro sat in Mexico City, and I think almost no one, apart from a very small circle of friends, possibly not even that, heard the music he was writing for decades. Uh, completely, completely cut off from the world um, for a long time, and uh, didn't really matter. So, I mean, if, if, if you know, the whole thing disappears around us, in terms of it, it, it crumbles to dust around us, which it very well might, um, you, you, you just have to cling on, you know, to that, to your island. I don't think it's going to be as bad as that. I hope not. Um, and I think that there, we've been heading for some kind of crash for a long time, and it's come. And uh, what that just has, we'll just have to build it back up again and build it better. So, so, but this is very appealing. So, your feeling for yourself is it's almost like an organic necessity to to do what you do, which is which is write music and. Uh, okay. I'd, keep, I'd, I'd be in the headlines for all the wrong reasons if I, <laughs> if I wasn't doing that. Uh, it's absolutely an organic necessity. It's, it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's exactly how I put it. Uh, Professor Purple is commenting that it is the responsibility of intellectual, uh, if intellect, intellectuals to the truth and expose lies. That's a quote from Noam Chomsky. Sophisticated musicians like you have a voice and you may use it. Even though I must say I'm curious what you, what you will answer, but I find that um, having a voice that is able to create music or sound music does not translate into necessarily having wisdom to make important political statements, which some of our colleagues um, tend to, I think, um, somewhat mistake that the two that the two voices are are one. But I don't know. What it, fortunately, responsibility and artists are two words that shouldn't exist in the same sentence. Um, because if we were to be responsible, then there'd be more damage than good done by it. We just, you, you, it's not about responsibility. I, I, I would say to the answer, someone says your responsibility is this, I would say, no, it's not. <laughs> and I think, I think this is perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, a good note to, um, to wrap up, unless, uh, unless you feel that I um, avoided touching some topic that, that you would like to uh, delve into. Or to... No, no, I, I mean, I say, you know, I, I, I hope the results of all this, this scribbling and stuff that I'm doing might, 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 I'm idealistic enough to think that they might by themselves have a message of some kind, but it's not because I put it in there. You know, it's, uh, it emerges from, from the activity. Someone can come along and say, oh, look, he's made a statement about modern life or whatever but that's not the the, the way the, the intention uh, the intention is not that to start with does that make sense a sort of yes like uh, all the theorizing about bach making uh, theological statements about the protestants and the and the and the catholics and all of that yes. searched for yes. centuries later but who Musical knows sound. Yes, well, uh, I think uh, we have the thrill of uh, your notes as um, independent, healthy entities that, that roam, roam our world and sound and, and give a lot of pleasure and amusement. But I want to thank <laughs> you for, for agreeing to come out of your compositional layer and, and also um, share um, your your thoughts that uh, that obviously are behind some of the processes that move you.
Well, thank you for having me and thank you to everyone I'm assuming is out there uh, for, for coming and for your very good questions. I sort of have to tidy up all this mess. Thank you very much, Thomas. <laughs> just, just very quickly, um, uh, you can go uh, register on the link there to receive the update about the next seminar. The next seminar is next Wednesday, Wednesday the 24th at uh, again at six in the evening Berlin time, five UK, 12 in New York. You make the calculations. I'm still waiting to hear for a confirmation from the person that I've approached. So uh, you'll hear from me by email anon about who that is. And uh, most importantly, thank you to Tom and uh, be well, stay healthy and uh, more music soon, we hope.